Well, good evening, everybody, and thank you very much indeed for that very warm welcome. Um, Crispin's absolutely right. One agrees to take on commitments in far-flung places, and then the nearer you get to the commitment, the more extraordinary the uh, challenge of getting there seems. But very, uh, very helpfully, I, I have been here, in fact, most of today, and notwithstanding the weather, and everyone's telling me that it's always been beautiful weather for this event in the past, so clearly I bought the bad weather. I've been exploring... Um, at St Andrews and have discovered it to be the most glorious city. I've been to the cathedral, I've been to the uh, castle, I've been to the botanic garden and I've been to a couple of the museums so uh, I do feel as if I've been very privileged actually and, and, and have spent some time here. And I would also like to say, because I won't get a chance to say later, my own personal congratulations to the finalists of the St Andrews Prize. I know that it's a very prestigious award um, and enormous care and attention is given to the process but uh, I, I hope to meet some of you this evening and also previous winners because this is an extraordinarily prestigious uh, prize and uh, an enormously important part of the way in which we encourage sustainability to be thought about and you won't be surprised to hear there's a certain amount of uh, relevance to what I, I, I want to say. But I'm going to start uh, with a figure who has meant really everything to me, been an inspiration for all of my working life. Um, a woman called Octavia Hill who in her 20s um, started uh, what was become a lifelong commitment to providing decent housing, and particularly for children and families in London. She, as a young teacher, used to take the ragged children from the school she taught at out of London to Epping Forest. It was a long walk. And because she felt it was absolutely vital that those children experienced nature, the wind in their faces, the trees, the flowers and the grass. And she said, back in about the 1860s, the need of quiet, the need of air, the need of exercise, the sight of sky and of things growing seem human needs common to all. By comparison with Octavia Hill, today's politicians and decision makers have lost the plot. They talk and behave not as if nature and these things are human needs, but as though the only thing that matters is the economy, especially growth as measured by GDP. Yet we know that the world we live in is much more complex than that, and that what makes people happy and feel that life is worth living is a multitude of qualitative attributes and relationships, not least those which Octavia talked about. Bobby Kennedy said in 1968, GNP measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything, in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. Now, one of the consequences, as you well know, of the focus on growth and economic progress that dominated the late 20th century is that we're consuming resources as if we lived on three planets, not one. And there is a continuing downward trajectory in terms of biodiversity and, indeed, quality of life for many people. We can't go on as we are, yet that, it seems, is just what we're being encouraged to do. Indeed, today, we not, see not only focus, but competition among politicians of all parties on the subject of the economy. Management of the economy lies, we're told, at the heart of political credibility. And it's assumed that this is the issue on which the next election will be fought. Yet, I ask rhetorically, will it be won in terms that we would consider winning? Aren't there other things in life that really matter? Because the real issues we face, unmeasured and largely undiscussed, are questions about the quality of our lives as humans and the environment on which we depend. Climate change poses the biggest threat to our long-term habitation of the Earth, yet it figures little in public and political discourse. Recent reports by the IPPC confirm that we now face forecasts of temperature increases well above the so-called tolerable level of 2 degrees Celsius, with consequences that I'm sure everyone in this room is aware of. So how can we change the nature of public and political discourse to embrace the things that really matter, the unquantifiable and longer-term issues, and to move away from the unrelenting focus on GDP and current economic performance as a judge of how successful we are? How can we, as the title of my talk says, go beyond money 
to value the things that really matter. It's time to stretch our minds and our imaginations and to engage people in ideas and a dialogue about a different future. It's also an opportunity to learn from history because in many ways we've been here before at the height of 19th century imperialism. In the second half of the 19th century, when Octavia was alive, Britain was, uh, witnessed an unprecedented exploitation of natural and imperial resources, not only here but throughout the world, of course, intensive industrialization and urbanization. The consequences were extraordinary, and huge wealth was generated for those engaged in that process of industry and trade. But for the vast majority, the human costs were enormous. Desperate living conditions, appalling housing, the spread of diseases such as cholera and high mortality rates eventually reached such levels that they brought about a crisis in public policy and parliamentary democracy, answered in part by the establishment of new political parties and eventually universal suffrage. It was not a coincidence that the same period saw the birth of many social, health and, and welfare charities, Bernardo's, NSPCC, the National Trust, RSPCA, uh, RSPB, and the birth of the welfare state and the public health movements. Octavia Hill's own remarkable work in public housing in, and, and in founding the National Trust sprang directly from her desire to right the wrongs of people's deprivation. And in response became an emerging official recognition of the need to intervene to protect vulnerable people in society and legislate for the things that the market wasn't providing. And interestingly, in spite of their ideological and historical differences, the Conservatives, of course, the Tories on the grounds of aristocratic paternalism, one might say, the Whigs with their liberal democratic reforms, and the new Labour Party, which was emphasising the role of the new state, all the political parties, in fact, recognised that certain public needs had to be met or protected by intervention. And there are many examples, early planning legislation, sanitation, housing, children's welfare, public health, and education. But the trigger, one might say, for an even more radical and, and an even more consensual approach was the tragedy of two world wars and the reconstruction program which was being planned even as the Second World War raged. By the early 1940s, two generations had laid down their lives for their country, There'd been enormous social upheaval and massive economic and social costs had been incurred. The Churchill-led cross-party war ministry of 1940-45 to was focused on winning the war. But other members of the coalition were determined that at least as much effort should go into planning the peace, the post-war reconstruction that they believe should be for the benefit of the country as a whole and all members of society. And when Labour won the 1949 election, that was exactly what they did, driven by this determination to rebuild a fair and united Britain. The raft of post-war legislation is extraordinary. It included the universal right to education, the establishment of the free National Health Service, an industrial policy which consciously dispersed investment and jobs throughout the UK, investment in farming to feed a nation used to rationing, a major housing improvement and construction programme, the protection of the country's natural and historic sites, and the designation of national parks, the spiritual and physical refreshment, and safeguarding Britain's most beautiful landscapes. Taken as a whole, the post-war reconstruction programme represented a rounded view of what society needed, reflecting material and non-material needs. Let me quote from a 1944 white paper, The Control of Land Use. Provision for the right use of land, these are interesting words, in accordance with the considered policy, is an essential requirement of the government's programme of post-war reconstruction. New houses, whether of permanent or emergency construction, the new layout of areas devastated by enemy action or blighted by reason of age or bad living condition, the new schools, which will be required in the Education Bill now before Parliament, the balanced distribution of industry, which the government's recently published proposals for maintaining active employment envisage, the requirements of a sound nutrition and of a healthy and well-balanced agriculture, the preservation of land for national parks and forests, and assurance to the people of enjoyment of the sea and countryside in times of leisure, 
a new and safer highway system better adapted to modern industrial and other needs, the proper provision of airfields, all these related parts of a single reconstruction program involve the use of land. And it is essential that the various claims on land should be so harmonized as to ensure for the people of this country the greatest possible measure of individual well-being and national prosperity. Now that to me is a remarkably public spirit, collectivist approach. It makes clear how the state intended to deliver public benefit, but it also acknowledges very clearly the importance of unquantifiable measures, the value of people's leisure time, and the protection of nature and national parks, as well as the things like jobs, roads and airfields that would lead to conventional economic success. It speaks specifically of harmonization, a word rarely used in policy today. So the white paper might, as a stretch, be described as an early recognition of sustainability, identifying the multiple demands on land and the need for careful and harmonised management as a limited and precious resource. The long-term goal is couched in terms that are explicitly about more than money can buy, the greatest possible measure of individual well-being and national prosperity. Now, those were heroic goals at a time when heroism was needed. But how successful was this harmonising programme? Well, in practice, as we know, the post-war period was a time of contradictions. First, and remarkably quickly, Britain's population had its first real taste of growth, not only trickling down, but reaching the working population. It was only 1957 when the Prime Minister Harold Macmillan was telling the nation that they'd never had it so good. In the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher brought material wealth to many working class families, enabling them to buy their own homes at discounted prices. And not least because of those post-war reforms, there was speed at the, uh, steadily improving public health and education. Each generation since the war has been healthier, longer lived and better educated than their parents. But second, alongside these obvious benefits, the cult of individualism began to develop. Now, this is often attributed, isn't it, rather loosely to Thatcher, but it had much earlier origins, with the second half of the 20th century coloured by a kind of growing materialistic sense of competition, you know, getting ahead of the neighbours, one-upmanship, rather than this pursuit of collective well-being that had shaped that immediate post-war period. Now, it's hard today to put ourselves in the shoes of those post-war decision-makers responsible for an unprecedented moment of renewal and reconstruction. Perhaps never before, perhaps never since, has motivation for a collective approach been stronger. Britain had survived, after all, the threat of invasion. Its people had given so much, with so many lives lost or irreparably damaged. And Britain's society had together endured major life changes, rationing, evacuation, conscription. It was clearly an extraordinary time, and that mood was hard to sustain in the face of the reality of the 1950s economic boom and the rise of the individual. Small wonder, then, that the emerging cause of environmentalism, in a sense, in those days, not couched as such, but as of protecting the things that really matter, those things in that 1944 white paper that really mattered in conservation terms, uh, had enormous challenges. Because conservation was part of that 1940s vision, but it was modest and protective rather than profound. And there was a slightly naive assumption that land uses like farming and forestry would be compatible with the protection of nature and landscape. In fact, as we well know, the, the safeguards put in place in the 1940s were inadequate to meet the pressures on land and natural resources that flowed from the accelerated pace of growth that took place from the 1950s onwards. Agriculture, even in national parks, became industrialised, with farmers paid to take out hedges, ponds and semi-natural vegetation and to grow intensive cereal crops, to plough up the heather-clad hills to enable ever more sheep to graze. Countryside was built over to provide those homes, jobs, roads and factories. New forests of alien species were planted and ancient forests were felled or underplanted with commercial timber crops. Seas were overfished. Rare or vulnerable species were pushed to the brink of and sometimes into extinction. 
Natural resources like coal and building materials were extracted at an ever faster rate, and we began consuming energy faster than new sources, at least then, were being discovered. And of course, the alarm was sounded with increasing urgency. In 1972, the Club of Rome published its seminal work, Limits to Growth, coinciding with the first oil crisis. And in the 1970s, the environmental movement, named as such, was born in the UK. Friends of the Earth in 1971 with those returning bottles campaigns we all remember. And Greenpeace, Rainbow Warrior, out there um, against the commercial whalers. The longer established conservation bodies actually fell out uh, with the farmers too at that point, with Marion Shord's The Theft of the Countryside setting the tone for a long period of tension. The English landscape, she said, is under sentence of death. Indeed, the sentence is already being carried out. The executioner is not the industrialist or the property speculator. Instead, it is the figure traditionally viewed as the custodian of the rural scene, the farmer. And so the second half of the 20th century was a time of fights about waste and power stations, marine exploitation against road expansion and quarries, against commercial agriculture and forestry, and for public access and the protection of archaeology, historic buildings, nature and landscapes against those 20th century intrusions. I, and I'm sure many people here, I know many people here, were all deeply engaged in those fights, trying to strengthen the law to protect our countryside and wider environment. But it was also a time of learning, of learning about the techniques of conservation and the skills needed to protect natural resources and our natural environment. And we all became very clever at it. I and my colleagues could quote from the Treaty of Rome and from endless pieces of legislation and subclause five of this, you know, nondescript piece of legislation. Um, and we also knew, we learned how to design a grazing regime for sheep and cattle in the Yorkshire Dales to sustain Herbridge hay meadows. We learned a lot about the techniques of conservation. National park and local authorities, conservation charities, government agencies all learned sometimes relearning old skills, but actually only consciously learning for the first time how to put in place conservation aspirations and to learn the conservation skills to put them into practice. And we were by no means unsuccessful because, in fact, the environmental movement became increasingly professional and there was an increasingly responsive public policy framework. Now, some of that was driven, as we know, by the UK's membership of the European Union, which set increasingly rigorous standards for, for example, clean air, clean water, acid rain uh, solutions, and the banning of substances like CFCs. But having designed the commercial common agricultural policy, the EU was also responsible for its reform, introducing the principle of paying farmers for looking after the beauty of the countryside and nature alongside food production. Domestically, of course, there were continuing arguments about planning policy and many attempts to weaken it, but green belts remained largely intact. And, you know, there were some, certainly some significant moments. John Gummer, as Secretary of State for the Environment, memorably put a stop to out-of-town superstores. And if you ever wondered what switched commercial supermarket investment back to the high street, it was that decision. Similarly, Chris Patton, as Secretary of State for the Environment, authored the first ever white paper on the environment in 1990, introducing the concept of greening as a policy that needed to be mainstreamed across all parts of government. And in the face of growing concern about climate change, there was slow but nevertheless clear progress in the UK's commitment to control CO2 emissions and invest in renewable energy, culminating in Labour government's 2008 Climate Change Act, which actually put into law our commitments. So all the parties played their part. Now, looking back, none of us was ever satisfied or felt that we'd got enough or done enough, of course, but actually it's important to acknowledge progress was made. And for a period, goodness me, being green was even fashionable. Looking at Sarah here, you know, that record high green vote in 1989 of 15% in the European elections. And all the political parties at various times established green think tanks and all had, you know, varying quality but good policies in their manifestos. 
And this interest, don't let's forget, to demonstrate sensitivity to green issues actually lasted until very recently. I'm sure most of us remember David Cameron's photo call with the Huskies in 2006 and his commitment as the incoming Prime Minister in 2010 to lead the greenest government ever. That seems quite a long time ago now. Indeed, the Prime Minister's latest comment on green issues in November 2013 was reportedly to order his officials to get rid of the green, <clears throat> I'm not going to say it actually, I'm much too polite, um, from energy bills in a drive to bring down costs. So this absolutely transformational um, negativity about green issues uh, came into play. So what happened? Why and when did the economy assume such overwhelming importance to all the political parties? Now, one reason I'm sure is that the 2008 recession represented a much more serious challenge to the system than previous economic stumbles. This time, it wasn't just that economic conditions became more difficult, but that the very foundations of the post-war economy were challenged, the levels of indebtedness and overlending the collapse of Northern Rock and the Lehman Brothers due to subprime lending and overborrowing, and the sheer sort of greed of the system sent shockwaves throughout the world. And the crash, of course, caused serious structural adjustments to pull back expenditure and a profound overhaul of many of the things that we'd taken for granted. And while many urged the government not to try to put back the economy as it was, many of us, in fact, the imperative to get the, government, the, the economy back on its feet dominated all the political parties' response and forced everyone into a much shorter-term view. Now, this left the whole environmental case and the non-quantifiable elements of policy exposed and vulnerable. And in a sense, I think, without consciously designing it, much of the progress we'd achieved had, in fact, been on the back of a strong economy. So when the economy collapsed, many of the issues on which we'd relied or the arguments on which we depended started to collapse too. But yet, if you ask them, the politicians are very sure what they're doing is right. And actually, they also quote public opinion as being behind them. They say, opinion polls tell us, number one issue is the economy. That's what people tell us they want us to do. So how do we interpret that? Well, perhaps it's about the quality of the dialogue. Because ironically or not, politicians are now those in whom public trust is now most frail. They fall into the bottom of the list of the professions, um, below journalists, nudging bankers who go up and down according to various factors, um, uh, 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 that people trust to tell them the truth, according to Maury Polls taken over the last few decades. But the questions I'm raising aren't so much about trust or the truth as about connectedness. People, it seems, expect the, gov the, the politicians at one level to be focused on the economy, but does that mean that they believe that politicians understand our lives and understand the things that we care about. And I think there, the figures on voting, <coughs> voters' engagement, actually the extent to which people are participating in voting now, with the notable exception uh, of the Scottish re referendum, which I think is just interesting, um, you know, is perhaps um, a more interesting area to explore. Neither does the government's focus on the economy always resonate Two proposals in my last year at the National Trust received a universal condemnation from the public, even though they were explicitly designed to promote growth and the economy. First, the plan to sell off the public forests. Well, that went down like a lead balloon, as we all remember. The government had to form a very smart U-turn there. But also the proposals, further proposals to weaken the planning system, which again, we were able to head off. I mean, those pressures haven't gone away. But the public was saying, no, we care about these places that are protected through planning policy and the things that they protect. So there have been all kinds of pressure, not least a steady, steady diminution in funding for many of the longer-term goals, whether energy efficiency, resources for natural England and national parks, or environmentally friendly farming schemes. And all of those have undermined public confidence, perhaps, and that government cares about the things that they care about. But there are some deeper human challenges too, because after, as I've said, decades of improved quality of life indicators, some of the progress made in the 20th century is now also faltering. As a nation, we're now predicting poorer health and shortening lifespans. 
and we now expect the current generation to be the first to be less materially well off than us, I would say collectively, not quite us, than uh, their parents. There is a particular pressure on our children with conditions such as rickets, obesity and mental health problems becoming more prevalent. Now we know these problems are real. We also know that they could be answered by a more integrated approach to policy and by longer term thinking. But the chances of achieving that change seem pretty elusive at the moment. So what might it take to create that movement for sustainability to which we all aspire, a movement in which the things that really matter are given the recognition they deserve and stand centre stage. This is a huge debate, but I'm convinced, ultimately, that the revolution in thinking and action has, in the end, to come from us. From us, the people, from asserting our human and environmental needs in terms that acknowledge the wider value to society and the planet of those non-material things that make life worthwhile. Top-down legislative and policy solutions are, of course, part of the answer. But it seems to me that the 21st century challenge is no longer the technical questions around sustainability, but the human ones. If we fail to engage people in the pursuit of more sustainable lifestyles, we will not succeed. And so we need to look to ourselves first. We learned a lot in the 20th century about how to do conservation and its technical challenges. But the challenge for the 21st century is different. It needs to be about people's whole lives about the ways in which we can bring together, to harmonise, to use that word back again from the 1940s, the multiple aspirations we have for our lives, recognising alongside basic human needs the value of those things that money can't buy, our health and our well-being, the relationships on which we depend, the quality of our lives and the experiences that make our lives rewarding and interesting. We need another paradigm to get away from the focus on money, growth and material improvements alone. And so I'd like to draw on that 1940s attempt again to harmonise, to oppose a coherent and more joined up response to the long term needs of our societies. Now, we ask ourselves the question, can climate change provide that rallying cry for a different kind of reconstruction that was so evident immediately after the Second World War? And if not, why not? And perhaps the challenge is still posed too much in those technical terms and not enough in those human terms. So these are difficult questions, but there are people that can help us. There are people in universities, there are people in the charity sector, the public bodies, there are people within government who can help us. For example, in 2005, Richard Layard demonstrated that more money above a certain level does not make people happier. And since then, there have been many studies on the development of possible alternatives to GDP as the sole measure of success. Very recently published um, is a study by Gus O'Donnell uh, for the Legatum Institute on proposing a well-being index to substitute for GDP. These arguments are becoming more mainstream. Influencing our behaviour around things like what we eat and how much we eat, how much exercise we take, and how we enhance the quality of our life has been the subject of many campaigns and many attempts uh, by the voluntary sector, Department of Health and others, with the government setting up a nudge unit to try and draw together some of the thinking and theory about these issues. Many research reports have shown how giving people access to green space, beautiful countryside, and the opportunity for exercise, exactly those words that Octavia Hill used all the, that time ago, do actually lead directly to improved life quality and life expectancy. It doesn't seem inconceivable, surely, that those ideas could be put into practice. And people are realistic, perhaps more than the politicians give them credit for. Most of us know that, frankly, we're not likely to get rich quick over the next few years and that our children are not going to walk straight into jobs and will have uh, challenges that perhaps um, previous generations did not experience. So already people are adapting, taking up activities and seeking experiences that don't cost a fortune but are beyond price in their value to people and their families. 
And just as an aside, it's no surprise to me that organisations like the National Trust, with four million members when I left at the end of 2012, have been so successful during the recession. People yearn for things that mean things to them in a human way when they know that materialism is no longer um, ac accessible. So we need, of course, also to value the things that we can measure, but we haven't really paid enough attention to. Um, in 2011, DEFRA published an ambitious national ecosystem assessment, which identified the value and the vulnerability of the natural capital on which we depend, the soil, the peat, the forests, the water, the habitats. And the Natural Capital Committee and the Ecosystem Markets Task Force are inching their way towards trying to insert those processes into decision making. And Tony Tuniper's book, What Has Nature Ever Done for Us?, puts numbers on the pretty incalculable benefit that nature delivers for people through functions we barely notice but we could not survive without. The work of the dung beetle, the pollination by bees and photosynthesis, just to name a few. So what should we do? Well, I've only been able to skim over the surface of some ideas, but fundamentally, I'm arguing that we need to reframe the way we value things and move towards that more integrated, harmonised and qualitative approach to human and social development. Believing, as we tried to do in the 1940s, that there is a bigger prize for humanity than short-term growth based on unsustainable foundations. So I want to leave you with just three thoughts about areas where I need, think we need urgently to make progress. They are three Ps. One is progress, one is place, and one is people. Progress, really the fundamental thing, is really this redefinition of what we mean by progress, how we monitor and measure it. And the first thing we need to do is properly value the resources on which our whole existence depends, taking nature as our frame and as our guide. So protect and manage sustainably what is irreplaceable, land, natural resources and biodiversity, and the natural systems that sustain them. Adopting this approach would really change everything, including the questions of GDP I've already discussed, but ultimately it would reshape the way that businesses and organisations operate, valuing human and natural capital as much as conventional balance sheet and profit loss accounts considerations. The second one is place, too often neglected, because really the starting point for having a chance of people living sustain more sustainable lifestyles must be healthy, vibrant, attractive places to live. People do not aspire to live less well, but they do aspire to live in places where they have those connections and where they have around them the facilities, the services, and actually the beauty that they need. There's a huge opportunity to remodel and green our cities, towns, suburbs, and uh, many, many parts of our, the living spaces that people occupy, to give people better access to housing, jobs and public services, like health and, and, and education, along with better access to nature and better places for children to play. That word placemaking, the love of place and beauty, are all integral to how people feel about their lives. And as I said, we don't think about it at a local basis and with people nearly enough. Finally, people, because ultimately, I believe we are citizens and not consumers. And we need to think about the needs and aspirations of people as partners in, not observers or victims of other people's decisions. As I said, we can't achieve anything without people. Too often, public policy or indeed, you know, so many aspects of life just treat us like consumers and expect us to behave like consumers, whereas actually I believe people are only too ready to get involved to shape their future, particularly at the local level. And behaving and treating people like consumers just is patronising and stereotypical and it fuels all those things that I think we saw in the second half of the century that led us to face the crisis we do now. Now, throughout my working life, I've seen such extraordinary work by volunteers of people taking part in things. And I believe there are huge opportunities for us 
to involve people in, in some innovative ways, although I do think it poses challenges to some of the conventional ways in which politics involves people. But I have one final plea, drawing again on the inspiration of, of, of Octavia Hill all those years ago. If we do nothing else, we owe it to the next generation to change the way that we educate and bring up our children. We are the generation that's benefited from the enormous wealth that was generated over the last 60 or 70 years. We are the generation that's imposed a heavy responsibility on the next generation and the next to sort out the problems we've left behind. And though the reasons are very, very different from those that Octavia Hill described back in the middle part of the 19th century, in many ways, children today are as deprived as those who she saw. Today, only a quarter of children play outside compared to, less than, to, to, to more than half only a generation ago. The area over which children roam and play unsupervised has sh shrunk by 90% in one generation. Children are not getting the experience of nature, the direct contact with nature that they need. Our educational ambitions in this respect have narrowed. And in our effort to protect our children, we've deprived them of the joy of playing outside, of experiencing nature at first hand, and from the delight of self-discovery. David Attenborough once said, people will only protect what they care about, and they will only care about what they have experienced. If we don't give our children access to nature, they won't know that it matters. One of the most joyous time of times at the National Trust is when we launched our campaign, 50 Things to Do Before You're 11 and 3 Quarters. I don't know if any of you ever saw it. It was an absolutely extraordinary and successful campaign, just bringing back that joy of the free-range childhood to uh, play in society today. The looming crisis we face is real. For a whole raft of reasons, our current leaders are focused on only one goal. One I suspect they know, as well as we, that it's much too narrow. But we have to get out of it. We have to find that alternative view. It's harder. It requires imagination, connection, integration, harmonization, and people to work together. It requires us to value the things that matter, that can't be measured, as well as the things we can count. We will only achieve change if we engage people in designing our collective future around that broader definition of progress, one that is defined and framed by sustainability goals. That challenge starts at home with the way we live our lives and the values and experiences that we instill in the next generation. So the revolution, when it comes, as I'm sure it will, will not come from our leaders. It will come from us. Octavia Hill told us, new occasions teach new duties. That challenge and the opportunity is ours to take. Thank you.